I'm very grateful uh, to Kelly and, and the committee for allowing me the chance to, to share with you um, some research that I've been uh, looking into. Um, I feel quite privileged to, to be given a chance to speak to the, to the food history section because I feel a bit of an interloper. But um, what I want to talk to you about is the um, uh, food of um, the news at the incarnations. Um, and I was inspired to. 30 odd years ago, but unbelievably, I saw the description of um, subtleties and special foods that were served at coronation. I thought, one day I'd like to write on that. I never thought it'd be 30 years, but luckily no one has, has pinched it from me. So uh, here we go. Okay, so um, I'm afraid I've got nothing spectacular as what you get on the throne. Uh, <laughs> I can't say that. Um, uh, the, um, oh. Got the title of Thrones, um, yeah. Game of Thrones. But here is uh, King Geoffrey, that's about his fabulous um, pie with, with the birds flying up. He doesn't survive very long to enjoy anything, but um, uh, I've got nothing as exceptional as that, I'm afraid. Um, it, but uh, I'm going to share it with you. So I've called it Symbols of Sovereignty Food, Pageantry, and Propaganda in Lancastrian England and France. There have been many, several studies on the use of propaganda by the Lancastrians to sell the ideology of the dual monarchy in England and France, especially in the first decade after its inception in 1422. Much has been written uh, or made of the dissemination of commissioned works, particularly by John Lydgate in England and Laurence Cullot in France to this end. More recently, the emphasis has shifted to consideration of the role food and pageantry played in legitimising the dynastic claim of Henry VI to rule in England and France. This paper seeks to add to this canon of literature twofold. Firstly, we will look at how sweetmeats, known as subtleties, came to play a small but innovative part in promoting the legitimacy of Henry VI's right to rule in England and France. Secondly, observations will be made on the pageants provided for the state entries of Henry VI into Paris and London in 1431 and 1432, respectively. Records of fine dining in England date from the reign of Richard II, his dates are 1377 to 1399. And menus detailing food served for the king on three occasions have survived. The earliest menu was for a three-course banquet hosted by the Bishop of Durham in London for King Richard and his uncle John of Gaunt on the 23rd of September 1387. It is preserved in a mid-15th century manuscript Harleian MS 4016. The other two examples were copied down more or less contemporaneously. One of these, hosted by Thomas the Dispenser, was most likely to celebrate his elevation to the Earldom of Gloucester in 1397. The other menu, date unknown, has the heading, quote, for the king at home for his own table, quote. On all three occasions, subtleties were listed, but no details given. However, under the Lancastrian monarchs, these sweetmeats came to play an important role in conveying royal propaganda. Subtleties, as they were known in England, or entremets in France, from the old French meaning between courses, evolved from simple, brightly coloured dishes or pastries to illusionary food such as peacocks and swans that were cooked and then reassembled to look as they did in life. By the late 14th century, the presentation of subtleties had expanded into the realm of theatre, displaying elaborate tableau from history or hagiography involving a combination of cookery, stage props and scene painting. Lack of detail in the records make it difficult to ascertain the precise composition of these more upmarket subtleties, but they appear to have been three-dimensional and in some cases edible, being sculptured from sugar paste, painted and gilded. In the 15th century, these subtleties came to serve as a means for displaying concepts of sovereignty. 
Subtleties were designed to be admired between courses and used not just to entertain and elicit wonder, but also to convey messages by the accompaniment of written text. These were known as reasons, which served to explain the meaning of the images and were probably read aloud. It is uncertain whether these reasons were edible. Subtleties of varying sophistication could form tabletop displays requiring viewers to interpret them, and so at a mundane level served as time fillers between servings. They were generally heraldic in nature, of varying size and quality, depending on the occasion and importance, as well as the financial resources of the host. It has been suggested that the role of the subtlety as a divertissement had its origins in practical necessity, i.e. the need for ingenuity and improvisation to overcome religious dietary restrictions during Lent or the unavailability of ingredients. It is certainly no coincidence that it was under the Lancastrians that we first see widespread evidence for the commemoration of public displays used to promote royal ideology. The picture there is the um, coronation of Henry IV in 1400. Firstly, there was a need to sell the legitimacy of Henry IV's claim to the throne following the deposition of Richard II in 1399, and secondly, to, um, to maintain support for the military activities of Henry V and VI in pursuit of their dynastic claims to rule France. Given the circumstances surrounding the, cer the coronation of Henry IV on the 13th of October 1399, it is not surprising that it was officially recorded in several texts. Emphasis was placed upon ceremonial ritual and the part played in it by the leading aristocracy. During the post-coronation banquet, there was a staged incident whereby the king's champion, Sir Thomas Dimmock, in full armour, entered the hall and proclaimed that he would fight a duel with anyone who denied Henry's right to rule. The king had the challenge announced four times throughout Westminster Hall, but there were no takers. Although this piece of theatre may not have been unique in coronation ritual, its occurrence at Henry's coronation is the first occasion on which it was widely publicised in the narrative sources. As for the food provided, only a list of dishes served over three courses survives. After each course, there was an unspecified subtlety. The menu for Henry's marriage to Joan of Navarre Dowager Duchess of Brittany on the 7th of February 1403 also survives and provides the first identification of a royal subtlety. The dinner consisted of six courses, three each of meat and fish, interspersed with six subtleties, but only two are described. Crowns for a subtlety and eagle crowned in subtlety, i.e. a crowned eagle, were served after the second and third fish course respectively. The presence of a crowned eagle with its imperial overtones is noteworthy. Although commonly associated with heraldry of the Holy Roman Empire, the eagle became a favourite English royal device from the reign of Edward III onwards. Edward not only adopted the eagle as his crest, but incorporated it within the iconography associated with the Order of the Garter. The crowned eagle motif was also popular with Henry IV and was displayed on the canopy of his tomb in Canterbury Cathedral, and you can see that today. Here you've got a, a, its um, personal seal um, image from um, the Kingdom of Navarre, Sancho VII, um, ruling um, 1194 to 1234. Coincidentally, the eagle also had an ancient royal connection with Navarre. Queen Joan's illustrious ancestor, King Sancho VII, ruling 1194 to 1234, known as the Strong, had used it as his personal seal. Sancho's sister, Berengaria, was married to Richard the Lionheart in 1191. 
Navarre proved a staunch ally to England and its crusader king while he was absent on crusade and then when he was in captivity. Henry IV had also supported the principle of crusading by campaigning with the Teutonic Knights and would have been aware of their heraldic use of the imperial eagle. Although a deliberate allusion to the historic friendship of England and Navarre cannot be proved, it would have been entirely appropriate as the marriage of Henry and Joan was not popular. The Great Chronicle of London gives a brief reference to the royal wedding. Joan's official entry into the capital and coronation at Westminster ended with the words, and there the king made a solemn feast in the worship of her and of all the strangers that came with her. In the next sentence, the chronicler gives thanks to God for English success in a skirmish that resulted in the death of several Bretons at Poole, two miles out of Dartmouth. Anti-Breton feeling culminated in Parliament's successful removal of Breton members of the Queen's household in 1406. It is perhaps not surprising that Henry celebrated his marriage in Winchester rather than London and chose to be buried with Joan in Canterbury rather than Westminster. We have no culinary details for the next coronation and the festivities of Henry V. However, we have an account of the banquet hosted by the king on the 17th of May, 1416, for Sigismund, king of Bohemia, soon to become Holy Roman Emperor. The culmination of Sigmund's visit to England was the signing of a treaty against France and his investiture as a Knight of the Garter. Appropriately, the theme of the subtleties served between courses was the life of St. George. According to the Great Chronicle of London, the first subtlety was Our Lady arming St. George and an angel doing on his spurs. The second subtlety was St. George riding and fighting with the dragon with his spear in his hand. The third subtlety was a castle and St. George and the king's daughter leading the lamb in at the castle gates. And all these subtleties were served to the emperor and to the king and no further. And the other lords were served with other subtleties after their degrees. Directions on how to make a St. George tableau are supplied by the 14th century cookery writer, the so-called Vandier of, T of Talavon. And I quote, For the image of St. George and the girl, make a large terrace of pastry or light wood, like that from which one makes palaces. Make the likeness of a saddled and bridled horse with the image of St. George on the horse a dragon under the feet of the horse, and the virgin holding the dragon tied by her girdle around its neck. The sparse instructions suggest that they were simply meant as an aid memoir on the composition of a St. George scene. Chefs were clearly expected to know how to create the cons constituent parts. Such vague details explain why we do not always know if a subtlety was edible or not. It is probably safe to assume that the primary concern in creating three-dimensional subtleties was that they serve as symbolic representations. Whether or not they were edible was a secondary factor. This is borne out by the Van Dier's instructions on how to make the dragon appear to breathe fire, which involves inserting tin metal into its mouth, stuffed with a piece of cotton soaked in camphor which should be lit just before serving. One might also reflect upon the etiquette expected of dinner guests. Given the predominantly religious nature of the more elaborate creations, one might question whether it was considered appropriate behaviour to be seen breaking off and eating bodily parts of the Virgin Mary, no matter how sweet. <laughs> On a prosaic level, the advanced preparation needed would, would suggest that by the time they reach the dinner guests, they would be inedible. It is clear that less elaborate subtleties, and thus by implication not worth mentioning or worth describing, were provided for guests of lower rank according to their degrees. The significance of Sigmund's visit in 1416 <coughs> and his admittance as a garter knight at the very least might suggest tacit 
acceptance of the concept of dual monarchy, which was not lost on contemporaries, as we will see. This is a, 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 a late 15th century copy of the Chronicle of the History of France, and it's showing you the marriage of Henry V to Catherine of Valois in 1420. The Treaty of Troyes, followed by the marriage on the 2nd of June 1420 between Henry V and Catherine of Valois, youngest daughter of Charles VI of France, marked the apogee of Henry's military career. The treaty provided that Charles would remain King of France for life, but that he would disinherit his own son, Charles the Dauphin, in favour of Henry V and his heirs. Later that year, on Advent Sunday, 1st of November, um, Charles VI uh, and Henry, as his heir, made a joint entry into Paris. Catherine was crowned queen in Westminster Abbey on the 23rd of February, 1421, and several chronicles describe the post-coronation banquet in detail. Between them, they provide the first substantive description of subtleties made for an English coronation, suggesting that surviving narratives were drawn from a now lost official record of the occasion. This is not surprising, given that Henry and Catherine were destined to be the progenitors of future kings of England and France. Forty-five dishes over three courses were served before the Queen, and several displayed heraldic imagery. In the first course, there was a lech lambard showing the arms of Henry V and Catherine with collars of Lancastrian S's and the Valois broom pod of Catherine's father, Charles VI. There was also a Lech de Masque uh, inscribed with Henry's motto, one and no more, uh, in, in, obviously in French, un sans plus, and a flampon uh, portraying a royal shield displaying three gold crowns on a field planted with golden fleur-de-lis and chamomile flowers. The third course included a meat pie with the image of St. Catherine surrounded by four angels. Quote, holding this reason, it is written to see and say by pure marriage, this war will not last. Close quote. Three subtleties were provided for dinner guests, of which the first two featured the Queen's name saint, Catherine of Alexandria. The first subtlety consisted of a pelican with her young and an image of St. Catherine in dispute with pagan philosophers, holding a book in her in uh, one hand and this reason in the other. Madam the Queen, the pelican answering, this means, and then the birds answering, it is of the king to uphold joy, he gives judgment to all men. What I'm thinking is, is that the, 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 the subtlety uh, of the figure of the, of the saint is actually gesturing out, here the queen, so that's uh, to uh, Madame the Queen. The pelican was traditionally believed to be willing to sacrifice her blood for the sake of her offspring, and so came to be associated with the figure of Christ and his redeeming blood, as well as motherhood and devotion. Although commonly associated with Queen Elizabeth I, References to the pelican motif on clothing or in the form of jewellery can be found in royal inventories from Richard II onwards. The second subtlety, served after the second course, featured St. Catherine with a wheel in her hand accompanied by a panther and two unidentified beasts. As with the first subtlety, they all had labels designed to be read in turn. Firstly, St. Catherine says in French again, the Queen, my daughter, to which the panther responded, in this island, and the other two beasts added the words of Albion and always renowned. The panther appears to have been a device favoured by Henry IV. In 1390 to 91, he gave King Richard a gold panther brooch with sapphires and, a, and pearls worth eight pounds while the menu for his wedding feast in 1403 included a pantheris, which was probably a pastry in the form of a, pa of a panther. The use of the vocative tense 
by uh, St. Catherine in both subtleties suggests that they were placed directly before the Queen with the saint pointing towards her. The third and final subtlety consisted of a tiger looking into a mirror and a man riding on a horse with a tiger cub in one arm and throwing mirrors with the other. The man says, by force, without right, I have taken this beast. To which the tiger responds, the mirror trick distracted me. The legend that tigers could be tricked by seeing its reflection in a mirror was well established in bestiaries by the early 13th century. This is one um, 13th century bestiary that's in um, at the British um, uh, Museum. uh, Sorry, British Library, um, dated from the 13th century. As events turned out, Catherine was queen for barely 18 months when Henry V died in August 1422, leaving an eight-month-old son, Henry VI, as his heir. With the death of Charles VI of France two months later, the baby king of England also became titular king of France. However, England and her ally, Burgundy, only controlled the area north of the Loire and and Gascony while the dispossessed Dauphin, soon to be Charles VII, held the south. It was left to a council headed by Henry V's two surviving brothers, John, Duke of Bedford, and Humphrey, Duke of Gloucester, with their uncle, Henry Cardinal Beaufort, to secure England, expand military control over the rest of France, and protect the infant king's dual inheritance until he came of age. Despite initial successes by Bedford, the advent of Joan of Arc and subsequent coronation of the Dauphin of Charles VII in Reims on 17th of July, 1429, clearly precipitated the need to secure the young king's claim to France with his own coronation. He was as yet uncrowned in England, and so a ceremony at Westminster was hastily arranged for the 6th of November, 1429, barely four months after the Dauphin. The intention was to follow this with a ceremony in France, which duly took place two years later on the 16th of December, 1431, in Paris. This next image comes from the so-called Beecham pageant uh, from the 1480s, uh, and it shows you um, uh, the the baby, um, or the back down, is it eight, eight, nine, Henry VI being crowned in England. The English coronation of Henry VI on the 6th of November, 1429, was a necessary prequel to his enthronement in Paris. John Lydgate, who has been described as the Lancastrian dynasty's unofficial laureate and chief propagandist, was commissioned to write the rondelle for the coronation of Henry VI and ballad to Henry VI upon his coronation. He is also credited with composing the explanatory texts or reasons that accompanied the subtleties served between courses during the post-coronation banquet, although none of the surviving nine copies bears his name. It is understandably the descriptions of the subtleties and Lydgate's verses which makes Henry's coronation banquet memorable. And here now I'll refer you to the handout uh, where we look at them. The first course consisted of a costard uh, royale, a sort of pastry, decorated with a leopard of gold holding a fleur-de-lis, a fritter shaped like a, like a sun with a fleur-de-lis, and a red jelly carved with white lions. This was followed by the first subtlety consisting of the English and French royal saints, Edward the Confessor and Louis the Ninth, while the young Henry, with, the, uh, with the young Henry VI between them, all in their coats of arms. Attached was a verse or reason. Lo, here two kings, right perfect and right good, holy Saint Edward and Saint Louis, and see the branch born of their blessed blood live among Christian, most sovereign of prince, inheritor of the fleur de lis. God grant he may through help of Christ Jesus, this sixth Henry to reign and be as wise as him, i.e. Henry V, 
resemble in knighthood and virtue. Promotion of Henry's royal descent from the French royal saint had begun immediately on the death of his maternal grandfather, Charles VI, in October 1322. Within months, the Duke of Bedford had commissioned a poem in French together with an illustrated family tree that was copied and displayed in churches throughout English-controlled France. In 1426, the poem was translated into English to foster continued support for the cause at a time when a power dispute between, Bedford, sorry, between Beaufort and Gloucester threatened civil war. The illuminated genealogy in the Talbot Shrewsbury book presented to Margaret of Anjou on her marriage to Henry VI in 1445, is believed to be a refined version of that circulated in 1423. Given the youth of the king, and by implication his dependence upon others to secure his, his dual inheritance, personal allegiance had to be secured by emphasis upon his dynastic right to rule both England and France. The second course of the uh, coronation banquet included viand blanc barred in gold, a party-coloured jelly with the um, text and musical notation of a te deum, Land uh, and a peacock served in its plumage. There was also a lech white set with a red, a red um, antelope, therein the crown about his neck and chain of gold. The antelope was a favourite device of Lancastrian kings. In addition, it was a, a meat pie decorated with leopards and gold fleur de lis. Another dish which might be seen as a subtlety, although not described as such, was a leopard's head set with ostrich feathers. This was followed by a subtlety that harked back to the visit made by the Emperor Sigismund in 1416. And again, I refer you to the sheet. Um, so here then, a subtlety, the emperor and the king that dead is, armed and hid their mantles, i.e. cloaks of the garters, and the king that now is, kneeling before him them with this re reason. Against miscreants, the emperor Sigismund hath shown his might, which is imperial. Ever since Henry V, so noble a knight was found, for Christ's cause in ex martial. Cherishing the church, Lollards had a fall to give example to kings that succeed, and to his branch especially, while he doth reign to love God and dread. The allusion to the emperor's visit in 1416 is significant. Robert M. Epstein may be right to emphasize that Sigismund was, Sigismund was presented primarily as, quote, a persecutor of heretics, quote, rather than as a, quote, authorizing emperor, quote. However, the significance of a subtlety showing two Lancastrian monarchs with the emperor clothed in their garter cloaks would not have been lost on the dinner guests. It is true that both Henry V and Sigismund were active in the condemnation of Lollardy, but the subtlety served to remind onlookers that a powerful ruler endorsed both the legitimacy of the Lancastrian dynasty and their dynast dynastic claim to France. As Epstein also said, the suppression of heresy loomed alongside the legitimacy of dynastic succession and the dual monarchy as one of the three overriding preoccupations of Lancastrian polity. Literature associated with the dynasty, therefore, invariably stressed the orthodoxy of the Lancastrian kings and their persecution of royalty. One is reminded of the closing words of Thomas of Walsingham in his panegyric on Henry V. Quote, he was also a distinguished soldier, favoured by fortune. In all his engagements in war, he always gained the victory. He achieved greatness in his building and foundation of mon monasteries. He was liberal in his endowments, and above all, those who were hostile to the faith and the church, he pursued and impugned. It is perhaps worth remembering that several of the elite guests were also garter knights, and so Sigismund could be presented as one of them. The third and final course of Henry VI's coronation banquet included a cold meat pie, like a shield, watery red and white, set with lozenges of gilt and flowers of borage, followed by a subtlety of Our Lady sitting and her child in her lap, 
and she holding in her hand a crown, and St. George kneeling uh, on the one side, and St. Denis on the other side, presenting the king kneeling to Our Lady with this reason following. O blessed lady, Christian, Christ, sorry, o blessed lady, Christ's mother dear, and thou, St. George, that called art her knight. Holy St. Denis, O martyr most entire, or, or perfect. The sixth Henry here, present, present in your sight, showeth the grace on him your heavenly light. His tender youth with virtue doth increase, born by descent and by title of right, justly to, rule, to, to reign in England and in France. Here then we see the dual monarchy was not only endorsed by the Holy Roman Emperor and the royal saints of England and France, but also most importantly by the Mother of God in their mutual espousing of St. George, her knight, and the Lancastrian cause. Henry VI was born by descent and by title of right, justly to reign in England and in France. Significantly, it was on the morning of St. George's Day, 23rd of April, 1430, that Henry VI arrived in France for his French coronation. French kings were traditionally crowned in Reims, but as this was not under English control, Henry had to be crowned in France. However, it was over a year before it was considered safe enough for the king to venture out of Normandy. Henry made his formal entry into Paris on Advent Sunday, 2nd of December, not 1st, as I said, uh, 11, 11, day, sorry, 11 years to the day since his father's uh, joint entry into the city with Charles VI on 14, in 1420. The anonymous writer of the so-called Parisian Journal provides a detailed account of the pageantry surrounding the young king's entry, which can be supplemented by material from the Burgundian chronicler Engerard Monstrelet, as well as from English sources such as the London letterbook K and the Brute. When reading the Parisian journal, it is clear that the, the writer was concerned about the impact that years of civil war was having on the political and economic fortunes of the city. According to the journal, Parisians were apprehensive from the moment the English king touched French soil. Henry was pointedly referred to as he, quote, who considered himself to be King of France and England. When news of his landing reached Paris on St. George's Day, orders were issued for celebratory bonfires to be lit throughout the city to the dismay of the populace because firewood was expensive and by implication scarce. Henry VI entered Paris via the Port de Saint-Denis accompanied by the major civic dignitaries. A blue canopy emblazoned with golden fleur-de-lis was held over his head, first by aldermen and then by members of the major guilds of the city taking in turns along the route. The journal says that the young king was particularly impressed by the first pageant, which consisted of three mermaids, quote, and in the middle of them there was a lily whose buds and flowers spouted out milk and wine for everyone to drink, who wished or who could. Above there was a little wood where wild men frolicked about and did very pretty tricks with shields. Everyone liked watching this. Those folks. The final pageant was held in front of the Châtelet, which was a, uh, which was a tableau of the king governing two realms with the advice of his council. According to the journal, a boy of the king's age and build was dressed in scarlet with a third hood with two crowns held above his head. On his right were personifications of French nobles, including Anjou, Berry, and Burgundy, identifiable by their coats of arms. And on his left were unidentified English lords, quote, all seeming to give good and loyal counsel to the young king. Quote. Representations of the clergy and citizens were placed nearby. It is tempting, but perhaps a little fanciful, fanciful, fanciful to compare the, compos the composition of the pageant with depictions of the Last Judgment. Last Judgment scenes traditionally place the good, in this case the French, to the right of Christ, and the damned, the English, to the left. The, the people of Paris needed only to recall the central doorway of Notre Dame Cathedral to make a connection. 
In any event, the journal presents a passive image of the young king being instructed by his elders. Monstrelet, however, gives Henry a more, pa a more proactive, positive stance. He states that the king wore his crowns rather than having them held aloft. Whereas the journal simply, says simply that the actor king was royally robed in scarlet and a furred hood, Monstrelet tells us that the robe was covered in fleur-de-lis. He also names the English nobles omitted by the journal and has them show deference to the king. And this is what he says. On his right hand were figures to, to personate the uh, Duke of Burgundy and the Count of Nevers. The uh, Count of Nevers is the son of the Duke of Burgundy presenting him with the shield of France. On his left were his uncle, the Duke of Bedford, the Earls of Warwick and Salisbury, presenting him with the shield of England. The portrayal of the Duke of Burgundy and his son giving the shield of France to Henry indicates how important Burgundy, Burgundian support was to the English. Privately, however, the Royal Council must have been concerned as to the continued loyalty of the Duke. Philip did not attend the coronation and made no attempt to acknowledge Henry's sovereignty in person during the two years he spent in France. The Paris progress ended with dinner at the Hotel de Tournelles, after which Henry visited his maternal grandmother, the Dowager Queen of France, residing at the Hotel Saint Paul. It is interesting to note the contrasting slants put upon this encounter by French and English sources. According to the journal, when she saw the young King Henry, her daughter's son, near her, he at once took off his hood and greeted her, and she immediately bowed very humbly towards him and then turned away in tears. However, the English noted that she was, quote, never so glad as she was then, since she saw the King of France in good condition, close quote, thereby implying that the Dowager Queen recognized her grandson as the rightful king of France and in so doing denied the legitimacy of her own son's earlier coronation of Reims. Henry was crowned king of France in Notre Dame Cathedral on the 16th of December, 1431. Monstrelet seems to take a perverse delight in dwelling on the fact that the English annoyed the French by insisting on performing the coronation in their own way and ended the ceremony by stealing the silver cup that held the communion wine. The cup was only returned after much expense and complaint to the Royal Council. Unfortunately, he had even less to say about the food served at the post-coronation banquet. Quote, during the dinner, four pageants were introduced. The first was a figure of Our Lady with an infant king crowned by her side. The second, a fleur-de-lis surmounted with a crown of gold and supported by two angels. The third, a lady and peacock. The fourth, a lady and swan. And then he says, it would be tiresome were I to re relate all the various meats and wines, for they were beyond number. And this is a common phrase. It's annoying in the veteran historian. As we can see, Monstrelet refers to pageants rather than subtleties, and they receive scant attention. Ideally, one would like to compare the subtleties provided for both coronations. It is tempting to suggest that Monstrelet's reference to the first pageant, a figure of Our Lady with an infant king crowned by her side, was similar to the final subtlety served at the English coronation, where Henry was presented to the Virgin by King St. Louis IX. At the other end of the scale, the journal complains that the coronation was badly organised. The lack of crowd control meant that the civic authorities, including aldermen, missed the service and had to share their table with gate crashers, such as cobblers and mustard sellers. The food provided was, quote, shocking, and at least for commoners, had been pre-cooked for three days. <laughs> A notable absence from the parish trip was Henry's mother, Catherine of Valois, who would have made, who would have been invaluable in promoting her son's dynastic right to rule France. She had been present at the English coronation in 1429, but by 1431 she had married Owen Tudor, her steward, which is a bit naughty, and she may well have been pregnant at this time, so clearly they couldn't wheel her out. Throughout the time Henry spent in France, one senses an air of uneasiness 
Five days after his coronation, the, in the young king attended a meeting of Parliament where he received the oaths of his Parisian subjects. He apparently acknowledged them in English, which would hardly have endeared him to the audience. By now he's about eight or nine. I mean, surely he could have mustered a few words in French. Within days, he left the city, and by mid-February 1432, he was back on English soil. Henry's return to France was marked by an official entry into London on the 21st of February, the anniversary of his mother's entry in 1420. The king was treated to seven pageants between London Bridge and St. Paul's, which were commemorated in a long poem by John Lydgate. He was greeted at London Bridge by a giant holding an upright sword who threatened to, quote, clothe with confusion, quote, the king's enemies. With him were two antelopes supporting the arms of England and France. As the young king crossed the bridge, Henry encountered three women representing nature, grace, and fortune. Grace was described as the source of gladness in towns and cities, while fortune carried two crowns that he was ordained to wear. Two further pageants offered him the gift of learning, the seven uh, liberal arts and wisdom. At the Cornhill conduit, Henry encountered a child actor dressed as a king, receiving more attributes for good rulership, including mercy, truth, and clemency. At the standard in cheap, the sixth pageant consisted of a green castle with two towers. On one side of the castle were displayed two genealogical trees, one showing Henry's descent, descent from uh, St. Edward the Confessor and the other from St. Louis. Clearly, this was based on the geneal geneal genealogy uh, posters that had been circulated in France. And you can see the branches on the tablet. Uh, shows me one. Close up. Yeah, slightly close up through there. Uh, on the other side of the castle was a tree of Jesse, suggesting divine sanction of Henry VI dynastic rule, right to rule in France. The tree of Jesse is, is like the traditional uh, family tree of, of Jesus. Richard Osberg has argued that spectacles laid on by urban communities such as London and Paris, quote, were never solely in the service of one idea, myth or sentiment, quote, but were a means of establishing a dialogue between a civic community and royal or ducal authority. For Osberg, civ civic pageantry was both, quote, general and specific, quote. General in that the images were quite formulaic, such as giants greeting the king at, city, at the city gates, personifications of worthy attributes, and conduits flying with wine, flowing with wine. Equally, however, the choice of pageants could serve a specific purpose in establishing a dialogue between the municipal elite and the king shaped by political circumstances. For instance, tableau could be created to issue warnings and remind the king of his duties and responsibilities. Comparative studies of Henry VI's entries into Paris and London have focused on the way in which their differing relationships with the king informed their choice of pageants. For Parisians, it was a matter of trying to establish a dialogue with a foreign regime Whereas for London, it was a case of reconciling expressions of loyalty towards the king and opposition to the ruling aristocracy who wanted to continue war with France. The imagery provided in Paris was dominated by the civic community. As the king entered the gates of Saint-Denis, actors personifying the clergy, the university and the bourgeoisie handed him heart-shaped bonnet uh, bouquets. Placards proclaimed that they greeted him with loyalty, humility, and common consent. The guilds had taken turns in carrying the royal canopy. In London, only the mayor played a prominent role in the proceedings, and the London pageants glorified London and its ruling oligarchy. In some respects, Henry's entry into Paris deliberately mirrored that of his father in 1420. Both kings processed into the city on Advent Sunday with a crowned helmet carried before them to symbolise their right to rule by conquest and inheritance. By contrast, the London entry was not marked by a display of royal regalia or allusions to the royal council as occurred in the Chatelet pageant. 
It has been suggested that the parish pageants reveal a lack of confidence in the young king's affinity with the city and its civic independence. For evidence of this one, need only look at the verses provided for the first and last pageant. The first tableau was Spain, who declared that Paris deserved to be ruled wisely. The final pageant in front of the Châtelet, depicting the king and his two realms, was accompanied by the following words. Your true French subjects have safeguarded the crown for you. And if it pleases the king of kings, you yourself will be safeguarded by them. It's hardly a ringing endorsement of English rule. For Paris, the political reality was such that no dialogue with the king was formed. Henry stayed less than a week in the city, and the political situation made it impossible for him to remain safe in France for long. He left, England, he left for England in February 1432 and never returned. In Lydgate's poem, Henry VI's triumphal entry into London, the city is described as, quote, the king's chamber, close quote which epitomised the ideal relationship between the so sovereign and his capital. It implied an intimacy, real or imagined, which was reflected in the choice of pageants in which the king was symbolically clothed in royal regalia and presented with the attributes required for good kingship. The attention was to show that London had a crucial role to play in equipping and preparing the king for rule. In considering the use of propaganda by the Lancastrian monarchies, three points stand out. Firstly, that much of the literature was directed to the English elite, which cannot be simply explained away by lack of French material. Secondly, that while paying lip service to the demands of royal government, civic authorities exploited the use of spectacle in an attempt to create their own dialogue with the king. Thirdly, it was with the Lancastrians that we first see written evidence of the innovative use of food imagery to promote their legitimate right to rule England and France. It is clear that from, the in from its inception in 1420, there had been a mixed response towards the concept of the dual monarchy. When it came into force in October 1422, England had to confront the political and financial ramifications of governing two realms and face the prospect of a long minority. Evidence for this ambivalence can be seen in the widespread use of propagandist literature by the King's uncles, Bedford and Gloucester, to promote continued financial and military support needed to make good Henry VI's French inheritance. In France, the circulation of poetry by Laurence Collot with an illustrated family tree emphasising Henry's Frenchness was intended to combat nationalist murmurings. Although Lancastrian spin took on a new intensity after the coronation of Charles VII in July 1429, it is noteworthy that much of this propaganda was directed at the English. There is good reason to believe that this was precipitated by the events of 1425 when the Royal Council was split by open hostility between Beaufort and Gloucester. It was Bedford who mediated between them to ensure an uneasy peace, at least while he lived. In 1426, Lydgate was commissioned to translate Callot's verses for circulation in England. It is likely that the illustrated family tree was also copied at this time and provided the inspiration for the genealogical tree depicted in the London celebrations of 1432 and the illumination in the Talbot Shrewsbury book produced in 1444 or 5. Lydgate was also asked to commemorate Henry's coronation in 1429 with the composition of three works, the rondelle for the coronation of Henry VI, the ballad to Henry VI on his coronation, and the subtleties at the coronation banquet of Henry VI. It is surprising that he was not asked to write a similar poem for Henry's French coronation. Anne Curry has suggested that up until the last minute, Bedford was hoping to gain control of Reims and have Henry crowned there. The decision to stage the ceremony in Paris was confirmed only weeks before the event. One wonders if the Royal Council secretly saw the events in Paris as a face-saving exercise, intended as a stopgap until the political situation favoured a more symbolic celebration in Reims. Comparative studies by Lawrence 
Bryant and Kirsten Barassa of Henry VI, entries into Paris and London, have revealed how the choice of pageants, although mindful of royal interests, were shaped by the discrete political realities faced by the civic communities. For both capitals, establishing a dialogue with the king, or more importantly at this point, with the royal council, to preserve or acquire rights of self-government and protect commercial interests was paramount. This explains the preservation in overwhelmingly urban records of the ways in which cities engaged with royal authority in public events such as coronations and pageants laid on for official entries. Finally, it is argued that the most innovative form of propaganda employed by the Lancastrians was their widespread use of food imagery to convey political messages. Creations from simple pastries to elaborate freestanding tableaux were used to proclaim the legitimacy of the dual monarchy. Detailed descriptions of dishes, especially subtleties, are understandably limited as they would only have been seen by a select audience. Even where a coronation banquet might be attended by thousands, the more elaborate three-dimensional images were confined to the top table. We can see this clearly in the description of the dinner provided for the Emperor Sigismund in 1416. There is enough evidence to suggest that, quote, minor subtleties, quote, in the form of pies and jellies ornamented with heraldic devices were available for the lower-ranking diners. By contrast, pageants were public affairs, a matter of civic pride, and so noted in detail by urban chroniclers. That said, it is clear that superior subtleties were meant to impress and be seen by all. In the description of Queen Catherine's coronation, the great chronicle says that her table was positioned on the dais at the southern end of the Westminster Hall. And here you might like to look at the rather um, uh, amateur, shall we say, um, a copy I've, I've made of a, a suggested layout of the um, of the um, coronation banquet uh, and your handout of Catherine. To her right, she, so she's on the she's at the southern end on the raised dais, uh, dais of the Westminster Hall. To her right was seated Henry um, Beaufort, Bishop of Winchester, and the Archbishop of Canterbury. To the left of the Queen sat the King of Scotland, the Duchess of York, and the Countess of Huntingdon. Further information uh, supplied by Fabian at the end of the 15th century allows us to piece together the seating plan of the other elite guests. So you've got to take that. Gregory's Chronicle indicates that a similar layout was employed for the coronation feast of Henry VI in 1429, although we don't have um, precise details. It has been noted that Westminster Hall was never intended to be a dining hall, but was built for ceremonial purposes. The royal household ate in the first floor lesser hall within the palace. Thus, the evidence for the location of the ki kitchen complex that served the great hall is uncertain, but they are likely to have occupied an, an adjacent area to the southwest, given that St. Stephen's Chapel and college buildings lay to the east. This would have enabled food to be served quickly to the king and queen, king or queen, from a left side entrance. Subtleties destined to be seen and admired by all were probably conveyed through the main door to the north. There was only one door in, a main door at the hall. So we perhaps came in through the north and then processed up the full length of the hall towards the guest in honour, so everyone can sort of have that. Subtleties played a small but important role in promoting the dual monarchy among the elite in a social setting. This is apparent from the number of accounts that have survived of the two English coronations most directly connected to it, that of Catherine of Valois in 1421 and her son, Henry VI, in 1429. Lydgate was commissioned to write explanatory verses or reasons to accompany the subtleties served before Henry VI. These sweetmeats served to emphasise the Lancastrian ideology to those who were present at the festivities. Oaths made to support Henry VI's kingship during the coronation ceremony were justified and reinforced by the choice of visual imagery presented during the post-coronation banquet. Participants could see, hear, and eat the political messages on display. 
Non-participants could also partake through the reading or listening to Lydgate's verses, which were widely disseminated. Thus, it could be said that in a subtle way, the ideal of the dual monarchy provided food for thought which could be consumed by everyone.